Now we have a panel discussion on decoding and understanding ART Act, the way forward. The ART Act, which is brought in to address the legal deficit of the fertility segment and increases awareness, keeping a tab on malpractices involved with these processes. In this deliberation, experts will not just decode, but they will analyze how the bill will regulate and supervise assisted reproductive technology in clinics and banks, prevent the misuse of technology and promote ethical practices. Dr. Manish Banker, Medical Director, Nova IVF Fertility is the moderator. Please take over. Good morning, welcome one and all for the first panel discussion, a very important and crucial one for the day. We are talking about decoding and understanding art at the way forward. A very important one, which is going to be discussed for the next 15 minutes. We have a stellar panelist lined up for the same. Uh, we have Dr. K. Madan Gopal, Senior Consultant Health Niti Ayo, Government of India. Welcome, sir, for the panel discussion. We have uh, Dr. Kamini Rao, the Medical Director, Millen, the Fertility Center. Welcome, ma'am. We have Dr. Shitish Murudia, CEO, Indra IVF, joining us for the panel. Thanks a lot, Dr. Murudia, for joining in. We have Dr. Jaydeep Tang, obstetrician and gynecologist, IVF consultant, Ashwini Maternity and Surgical Hospital. Welcome, sir. Thanks for making time for the panel. And we have Mr. Amit Karkanis, senior lawyer practicing medical legal issues. Since it's uh, on act, we uh, we wanted a legal uh, expert here, and I think Mr. Amit will give us more insight on it. And to take take us on this deep insights on the art act, we have Dr. Manish Banker, Medical Director, Nova IVF IVI Fertility, as a moderator. Thanks a lot, uh, Dr. Manish, for accepting our invitation and being moderator for the session. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much, and. A pleasure to be given the opportunity to moderate this panel discussion. So the ART Act had been on the uh, agenda for the last 15, 20 years. And I think people like Dr. Kamira have been working on it for a long, long time. And it has finally seen the light of the day. And we have the Act notified in the Gazette on 25th of January, 2022. Now, the Act has been enacted with various purposes, primarily to prevent the misuse and have safe and ethical practice of ART services. Secondly, to cover the freezing of gametes, embryos, and embryonic tissue as a part of fertility preservation, and also to regulate and supervise the research and developments happening in this particular field. So the Act defines assisted reproductive technology as all techniques which attempt to obtain a pregnancy by handling the sperm or the oocytes outside the human body before transferring either the gamete or the embryo into the reproductive system. So my first question to Dr. Jaydeep Tan would be, what all procedures or processes or treatments are covered under the ambit of this act? Uh, thank you very much, Manish. Uh, let me begin by saying that it's a real privilege to be a part of this very erudite and uh, experienced uh, panel. Uh, Manish Bhai, I think there was an attempt perhaps to cram everything about ART and IVF into one piece of legislation. Uh, I'm sure all of you know the quotation in Mahabharata which says, whatever is here may be found elsewhere and what is not cannot be found anywhere else. And I think to a certain extent, the ART Act attempts to do that uh, because it tries to cover just about every aspect of the ART Act. And it does so in a tone, which I must say uh, is rather regulatory in nature. I understand that that is a poor pun, but truly speaking, it is so. And when I compare this to the last act in which I was involved, that was the MTP Act, 
I see a very large difference in the tone and the tenor of this act vis-a-vis -vis the MTP Act. The MTP Act, for example, is an empowering act for women. It's a protective act for doctors. And this act uh, with its tone and tenor seems to be more about regulation rather than empowerment. Having said that, we are not here to criticize the act, but rather to understand the fact that this act has now been passed. And since it's the law of the land, we do our best to follow this act. So I would have to say that broadly speaking, and I'm sure we are going to delve into the nuance later, uh, the act essentially talks about uh, formation of certain authorities uh, for regulation of IVF in this country uh, with the formation. What I wanted and, was what all procedures would be covered so that at least the people know. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So as I said earlier, like the quotation from Bhagavad Gita, it all covers almost everything. It, there is a misimpression that it does not cover procedures like IUI and it covers only IVF and that is a gross misconception. It does cover IUI. Uh, it doesn't cover follicular studies, I think, but it pretty much covers anything where you handle gametes. Uh, so starting from intrauterine insemination with the husband's sperm, with donor sperm, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, it also talks about the duties of clinics, offenses, penalties, etc. But Manishka, before I uh, before I cede the floor to anyone else, I just want to point out one thing about this act uh, because you asked me what it covers and. One important part about this act that has really not been talked about is the fact that section 42, which talks about the rules that have to be made for the act, is actually extraordinarily extensive. I've hardly seen any act where what has to go into the rules has been elucidated already in the act. Normally, the rules are supposed to give life to the act. The rules are supposed to tell us how to follow the act in daily practice. And if you look at section 42, it has 28 items yeah. where they say that these items have to be covered in the rules. So I'm quite sure that the document on rules is going to be much more extensive than the act. Uh, but just to paraphrase again, everything is covered under the act, starting from intrauterine insemination to the most advanced procedures like PGD, et cetera. So, so essentially, as you rightly said, this will cover IUI, IVF, freezing of gametes, PGT. It will also cover fertility preservation, which we have not thought would be a part of this. So for an individual or for a couple, and it will also regulate research in this entire field. Now, one other controversy about this act is that the section one mentions that it comes into force on the date on which it has been notified, and this is 25th of January, 2022. Section 15.1 then mentions that no person or clinician undertake this unless that clinic or bank is registered. But section 53 gives a leeway of a period which extends up to six months if you add all the boards and everything that are being formed. So the question now my to Dr. Madan Gopal is, what is this extension period for? In the sense, is it only to define who can practice ART or it also defines what all can be done, what cannot be done? So does it mean that since you are not registered, you are allowed to practice, we can do everything? And secondly, if you were not in existence on 25th of January, can you begin a new clinic on 26th of January? Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, thanks for this opportunity and uh, uh, this very pertinent question. Because if you look at the act itself, uh, which specifies, which has defined the clinic, which has defined that uh, until the time the regulatory mechanism or the registration mechanism happens, the, the existing mechanism under the surrogacy uh, act would be, would be continued. And the clinics which are already participating, they need to re-register for uh, under this ART Act till such time. This six month period is given for that. That means given the time for registration. But it has also mentioned that no person shall establish any clinic or bank for undertaking assisted or under assisted reproductive from unless such clinics or bank is duly registered under this act. That means this six months is a provision which has been given for the existing clinics which are already carrying out the, uh, the uh, already existing under the Surrogacy Act, they are under the body and the mechanism which are there. 
they can continue, but they have to apply uh, and re-register themselves so that uh, they can continue to practice and provide services. But no other person apart from the existing persons can practice as of now. I hope I have been able to answer this question. And in the sense, what is allowed, Dr. Kamini, would you like to expand on this or maybe Amit can also give a brief on this? I'd like to ask uh, Dr. Madan Gopal, does it mean that we have six months time because what uh, we don't have in the States any particular registration form and whom do we register with as of now? Because all the States have only a registration with the uh, Blue Hut Bangalore or any current city corporation, but we don't have any kind of registration because the ICMR had a registration form, but it was not mandatory. Now, when you say registration, the clinics have to register with whom? That is the question now which are already registered. Now, the six months time is given for what? Register with whom? I think the six month time has been given for the banks or the national boards to be formed. And once those are formed, we will have to apply to this board. But the question, Amit, to you is, till you are registered, what can you do and what you cannot do? Because does this mean that since you are not registered, you are not obliged to follow the act? Manish, can you take back one slide below, uh, behind, please, if you don't mind, because uh, answer to that. Yes. So if you see section 15.3, what it says is from the date of establishment of national registry, your six months is starting from that time. Yes, absolutely. So that is a thing that we need to keep in mind, that till the time this national registry or the incidental mechanism around it is set up, you have six months from that day. So uh, coming back to the ICMR registration, which Dr. Rao very rightly pointed out, I see that ICMR registration now uh, being a history because uh, uh, depending on whether ICMR will be the national registry or no, that is a government's decision. But whatever you have done under ICMR guidelines will uh, not necessarily be of any help here. And like, uh, uh, you know, the other panelists, uh, honorable panelists mentioned, you have to re-register it. And that deadline of six months will start from the day of establishment of the national registry. I think it is on the expiry of six months from the date of commencement of the act. That's right. But then it also says 60 days. Yeah, the expiry days from the registry. Six, yeah. 60 days from the registry. It's so six months from the enactment of the act. Yeah, six months from the enactment of the act, but yes, from the registry. Yeah, yeah, but the registration will have to be done with the national registry. Uh, yes. Manish. So yes. that's why, uh, since we don't have that registry in place, so I assume that the registry will be set up as early as possible. And uh, if the existing registration that you all have done under ICMR, if they get approved by the government, or if they are adopted the way it is, then I don't think so. Anyone will have to re-register. But I don't see that happening. And uh, whatever now you need to do, you need to do within this four corners of the law. Because like Dr. Jaydeep rightly mentioned, we whether we like it or we don't like it, it is now the law of the land. So whatever from 25th of January 2022, the government has notified the act. And whatever are the guidelines given in that, whether it is the number of cycles that the donor can undergo or how many sites you can retrieve from the donor and the responsibility of maintaining the documents, you know, will all now start on 25th of January 2022. And whatever is mentioned in the act will have to be followed. And obviously the rules are yet to be notified. And if you see section 42, like Jaiji mentioned, it says that uh, it has got 28 points and it has a last point also which says that if anything else also uh, is required, then very important, really. basically. So uh, I think- Would you like, like to come in for a short time, you say? Jaydeep, would you like yes. to- Yes, yes, Manish. I, I would just like to ask for a clarification from Dr. Madan Gopal. He said that clinics which are already existing and I think he used that word. Does that mean that new clinics are not allowed to commence activities in this uh, period of six months or before registration takes place? Does it mean that from 24th of whenever the act has commenced, no new clinics can be allowed to start till they get registered? Or does it mean that new clinics can start because there is this period of six months and within 60 days of formation of registry, 
these clinics have to apply. I think this clarity is rather important for anybody who wants to start the new clinic. Ajayati, that uh, clarity is there. If you look at the sections which are given, that means uh, the registration is mandatory. Without registration, one can't enter into new practice. That's clearly there. We have to just see that whether the national, whether the national registry will form. Another provision which has been given the exchange regulatory mechanism, the registration mechanism under the surrogacy regulatory act, which is there. Instead of supplement to that act, that, that mechanism would be leveraged and used. Because if a new thing is not formed, there could be a possibility that the existing mechanisms can be used. Though there would be uh, uh, change in the, uh, uh, what to say, uh, that the validity of that registration is different in both the acts. So that that would be there. That mechanism already existed. We have to see and wait till the rules are made. The controls for the rules are already given in section 42. It's already there. So we have to see that it becomes like easy for the people to make the rules now based on this 28, 29 points. I think this act also mentions in terms of who qualifies as a couple and who qualifies as a patient and also what are the age limits for the man and the woman. So my question, Dr. Kamini Rao, is who all can avail of this treatment and who all are, who cannot undergo? Because at some point in time, fertility is a fundamental right. To have a child is a fundamental right of every couple. But this law is in the sense, what about uh, living in relationships, single man, all those kind of things? What, how do you uh, comment on this? Well, according to the Act now, and we can't do anything more beyond this, we'll have to follow this Act and uh, rather than to debate on this, uh, all those women who are between the age of 21 to 50 can avail of this um, services. And of those who are for men between the age of 21 to 55. Now, in so far as uh, the living couples, well, they have not been really recognize that they can actually go in for these kind of treatments. Now, when you say it is a fundamental right to reproduce, the government is not saying you can't reproduce, but you can't take the ART services. So they are not coming in the way of your fundamental right to reproduce. You reproduce normally. So in that way, they are not actually coming in the way. So you can't blame the government for that. The only thing is to go through these assisted reproductive technology is what they are saying you can't do. So, so far as you apply this law, they say that you can't do this. You can get, what, uh, what about single individuals, a single man, single woman, or well, single woman. man? Well, they say single man, no, and uh, a divorcee, ever married in a sense, a uh, widow. They have said if she has been married once and then she can go ahead. Well, there has been a differential because of the uh, nature of the man and the woman. They have allowed the woman, but they've not allowed the man. You may say that there is a gender disparity. Well, Amit is wanting to say something here. Yeah. Uh, yes. So quickly, Manish, uh, is that if you see the definition of patient in section 2N, uh, yeah. there is individual. Uh, or a couple who comes to any registered assisted reproductive technology clinic for the management of infertility, basically. So now there is a dichotomy here. You know, on one hand, they have used the definition in the patient's definition, they have used the word individual or a couple, basically. Okay. Now, uh, what definition do we attribute to that? Whether ordinary Oxford English definition should be given to an individual or a couple. And fertility management, okay, so they have covered, uh, even if you go for a normal advice to a, uh, to a doctor for uh, uh, AI for fertility related issue, I think so that falls and you become a patient. And if you see it, um, Amit, the way I see this is that because this act covers fertility preservation also, yes. it gives exactly. access to a single man to man have also. access to fertility treatment. Now, if that man wants to have a child, it will fall under the surrogacy act because yes, it, that is it takes away from him. That is how I see this. Yes. So the next question then is the is mechanism about the boards and the various uh, registries. And this was a bit confusing to everyone. So Dr. Shiti, if you could just take our viewers through what is this whole mechanism that has been put forward for registration of the clinics and the banks? 
Hi, morning everyone and thank you uh, um, ET Health World for this uh, um, uh, for this discussion and um, it's it's a pleasure to be with all these stalwarts in the industry, Dr. Uh, Banker, Dr. Kamni Madam, Dr. Jadeep Tank, uh, Mr. Amit and Dr. Madan Gopal. Uh, very warm welcome. Uh, I think it's already been discussed, uh, Dr. Manish, that uh, the central government should form the national board within three months of the commencement of this act. And then the state government would form the state boards and the union territories would be formed by the government. And the national board should lay down the rules and regulations to give power to this act. After the national board and the state boards are formed, a period of 60 days would be given to all the clinics and all the banks to get registered to apply for this. And after the application, a maximum period of one month will be given to the appropriate authority to either accept your application and give you registration or to reject your application and with written instructions as to why they are rejecting with a, with a provision to give a show cause notice or maybe a, 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 a chance to explain yourself as to why your registration should not be given. And then obviously there are provisions that you can appeal to the state authorities for the for the registration if, if you are not granted registration for your clinic. So I think there's a clear window and that's how I understand is the six month period being given in 15 section 15.3 is a three month for the formation of a national board, two months for the clinics and banks to apply, and another one month for the appropriate authorities that would be formed at every district level to grant you registration or to reject registration. So that we have that six month period for, for regulation of clinics and banks. Two understandings which I understand that this windows are the maximum period. It could yes. be shorter than this. Uh, yeah, the government that. can form the state boards earlier than and the essential purpose behind this window is to give existing clinics the time to adapt to the infrastructure, the manpower requirements that will eventually come out in the rules. So it is a kind of a preparatory time that is being given to clinics because if the application is rejected, they have to give a reason as to why that application is being rejected. The Act also mentions about the various uh, registries, the national databases for both ART and surrogacy. So the question here to Amit is that the registries may be formed six months down the line, but what about the procedures or data records of procedures happening from 25th of January till the date that the registry is formed? Can they ask for retrospective data? or is it only after the registry is formed? This is a very good question, Manish. Uh, formation of rules is a delegated legislation, you know, and uh, what would happen, uh, we need to see what kind of rules they notify because uh, normally speaking, uh, when from the day of notification of the act, that is 25th of January, 2022, till the formation of the registry, since the act is now in place, they may ask you that, okay. So uh, there is a possibility of they asking you because they have a legitimate power to exercise from 25th of January 2022 onwards. So uh, according to me, uh, it all depends on whether the government is nice to you or no. Uh, it all depends on whether they want to create a logistical crisis or no. And uh, whether they want to be, uh, you know, uh, professional and say that from the day I am setting up my registry, you please start sending the patient data from tomorrow onwards, basically. And whether it will be physical or whether it will be online, that also remains to be seen. Uh, taking example of the fiasco that one big IT company created for income tax portal, I'm not very sure whether the government will form uh, the mechanism for online registration so quickly, even if it is handled by companies like Infosys or TCS. So we don't know about this right now, but according to me, from the day the act comes into force, they can ask you for the details and you should be ready with that. So if you have paperwork, you must have to preserve that. And if tomorrow they ask you for the data, you will probably need someone to feed that data. So you may have to incur that additional burden or cost for uh, employing people, Manish. So right now, my answer is that yes, you will have to do it. No, but, uh, it's good for the government data. to be nice to you. So I, on the on the safer side, maintain the data. Absolutely, Manish. I would definitely recommend that. Yeah. But Manish, we are always maintaining the data, so there's no additional burden anyway, Amit. 
they are all the time maintaining the data. You know, you are in charge of our data, Nari data, so you know that. Yeah. Ma'am, uh, data entry will be a big problem if they give you an online portal. So imagine six months data, if you have to register it online, you will have to make two or three people uh, sit and do that physical typing in, ma'am. So that's what I was referring to, ma'am. But I agree with you. I think the yes. act also speaks a lot about the duties and the responsibilities in terms of uh, who has to do what, uh, what kind of counseling needs to be provided. You need to discuss about the details of the procedure, the risks, the side effects, help them arrive at a commission, at an informed decision. And at the same time, also ensure that the information is confidential and it is not leaked to anyone other than the couple. So Jaydeep, you have been a part of the MTP movement as well in this. So for a practicing doctor, what would be your suggestions that this will be your duties and responsibilities broadly? Of course, we need to look at the rules, but what should you be ready about? Uh, thank you, Vanishka. Uh, I think I will divide this answer into two parts. I'll first try to give an overview of duties and responsibilities. And after that, speak specifically of around four duties and responsibilities because uh, those impact practice directly. This all begins in Chapter 4 of the Act. And uh, Chapter 4 begins by outlining general duties, consent and record keeping for both clinics and banks. And then it steps into the duties of the clinics. It also talks about what to do when you're doing a PGT, how do you source gamete, storage and handling, restrict sale uh, of gamete, zygote, and embryos, talks a little bit about research and then attributes all the rights which a child would have to a natural born pregnancy to an IVF pregnancy. But specifically, particularly for those who practice, I think some things which might change in your practice are the act says you need to provide professional counseling to commissioning women, uh, to commissioning couple and women. That might change your practice because you may need to hire a professional counselor or you may decide to undergo professional counseling courses yourself and say that I'm the one doing the professional counseling. The age limits which previously were not there have come in. So a woman above the age of 21 and below the age of 50, and a man above the age of 21 and below the age of 55. Uh, written informed consent and their consent forms will probably be elucidated in the rules or the regulations, depending in one place I saw, they said, do it will it happen in the regulations. In another place I saw it will happen in the rules. So those forms will have to be prepared and used Insurance coverage, uh, and that I think is going to be a bit of a naughty issue because uh, by naughty, I don't mean naughty, I mean K-N-O-T-T-Y, naughty, K -N -O -T -T -Y, naughty. Uh, <laughs> because the product will have to be first, uh, you know, obtained. And I think, uh, uh, Amit, I'll just finish and then maybe you can come in. Yes. Or you wanted to say something specific about on, on insurance, Jaydeep, there is a very tricky thing which they have said in the explanation to uh, uh, the section. You know, they say that uh, even an arrangement by a couple to give a guarantee that they will they will pay a uh, pay a donor uh, some money. That is also it says very clearly insurance means an arrangement by which a company individual or the commissioning couple undertakes to provide a guarantee of compensation for specified loss, damage, complication, or death of oocyte donor during the process of oocyte retrieval. Yeah. So here, you may not have to wait for the product. You will have to put the burden yes, on the uh, I, I would rather have a product, very frankly, as a clinician. I'm sorry, Manish, if you are digressing a little, but I think this I is think an this important... This is one of the issue, and I think this yeah. will come in my next question. So okay. this, is, this is... Then, uh, so then it also talks about the fact that you have to maintain records for 10 years, which is something, again, which is a little different. Okay. It specifies not more than three embryos. Uh, it says about mixing of gametes and mixing of sperm. And I think probably the most contentious clause of the clause, which has generated the maximum amount of discussion on our very learned forums like WhatsApp and Facebook uh, are the uh, clauses which pertain to oocyte donors, then they should donate only once. And I must admit very frankly over here, 
that after more than two decades of experience, I've still not learned how to make a donor produce only seven oocytes, which I will retry, make sure that they are all M2, and after all that, fertilize them and have oocytes which are left over to freeze them for the same patient. So I confess I'm really at a loss uh, with this point, even after so much experience. Uh, and those are briefly the highlights. There are so many more duties and responsibilities, but I do hope that the rules particularly elaborate on this issue of donors. Clarification, Opul. So I think you rightly touched upon this, the lot of issues about oocyte donation, the insurance coverage, this and that. And in the absence of all this regulatory... But, uh, Manish Bhai, yeah. I just want to ask you, Whose responsibility is it to find out whether the donor is donating for the first time or uh, nth time? Is it the clinic? But the fact is, the if the woman comes and says it's the first time and she forges those Aadhaar cards, etc., are we going to be Very responsible much. for it or how? So I think this was my question to uh, Dr. Shitik that how do, see, these are a lot of restrictions which have been put without the support mechanisms or without sometimes the scientific uh, support. What do we do in this scenario, Shitik? I think uh, rightly put by other, other panelists as well, see, ART banks are not existing as on date. It, it will have to wait for the national registry, the rules and the registration process, and then it will be. So up. Uh, Till, till that time, you cannot stop doing IVF for the patients who have already registered. But at least we can follow the guidelines to the maximum possible that don't retrieve uh, more oocytes. And obviously, seven is not the uh, not the right number, as uh, Dr. Jadeep also said. And we've been practicing for long, and we know that it's humanly impossible to retrieve seven oocytes only and expect all of them to be mature. And, and although I'll, I'll come to this question next, but I think what we have done change in our practice is uh, do a minimal stimulation for all, make sure all the donors have to be on an antagonist protocol, make sure that everybody receives an agonist trigger, so that the idea is to reduce the complications, the incidence of OHSS in these donors, because the government is of the view uh, that donors are being unnecessarily pumped in hormones to generate more and more eggs, and that leads to some detriment to their health or OHSS or complications or deaths that might have occurred in the past. So I think, I think what we can reduce in a clinical practice is do a milder stimulation, aim to retrieve somewhere between 7 to 12, 15. Obviously, that number would come up with the rules and regulations as to what should be the right number. Uh, and then follow an antagonist protocol, agonist trigger, so that no HSS and follow the donors after the pickup so that they even if they develop mild or moderate symptoms, you should be able to handle them. Uh, insurance, I think we've already talked about. Uh, uh, on, the, on the banks and the clinics to identify whether this is the donor that is donating first time, I think this will come with the Aadhaar registry that would be given access to the ART banks. Uh, uh, we currently follow a system where we register the face and fingerprint and you know uh, we can identify at least uh, in our system that if some donor is coming for the second time uh, and it's common as Dr. Kamni Madam said, people would come with fake Aadhaar cards, they would put their photograph and select somebody else's, but ultimately it's the responsibility of the clinic currently and the banks later on to identify such fake cards. And obviously the government should come with some infrastructure uh, with the linking of the Aadhaar system, the website, to identify these people right from their fingerprint or face matching where you can pull the data from the Aadhaar website. And I think the number seven has come from where I'm not very sure, because even if you go by global consensus, uh, the Vienna consensus, which is the most talked about consensus, which lists the benchmark and the competency values as if any lab across the world is functioning, you know, 75% should be the M2 retrieval or oocyte retrieval from the follicular puncture, 80% should be the fertilization, 40% should be the blastocyst rate, 35% should be the implantation. You would get at the one embryo out of, out of seven. This, this is the minimum standard that is expected because IVF is not a super 100% efficient process. If I start from 12 or 15 oocytes, I land up to one implantation. So we should consider these ratios and at least give every couple a reasonable chance to at least reach to the implantation stage. If I start from seven oocytes, I know 30-40% of my patients from day one I know they would never reach an implantation. Forget about live birth and the 
attrition from implantation to live birth, they would not even reach the implantation state. And even if you calculate all these competency and benchmark values, you need minimum of 12 oocytes or 15 follicles at least to reach to one implantation in every couple. And I think it's it's a human right for every couple opting for an ART procedure, giving so much of money to at least have that fair chance of pregnancy. So I think two points we had very clearly come out. And I think this is one area where we need the benefit or we need to see what is put in the rules. Because from a clinic or a bank perspective, we can only be sure that that donor has not donated in our clinic for the second time. How do we ensure that she has not done anything outside of the clinic? And on this seven number, I uh, maybe let us pause for a moment and say that this seven number might be a challenge. But what if the number is 10 or 12? Can we even ensure not more than 12? So from a medical perspective, any number will become a challenge. Unless there is a range or a reasonable period. I mean, even if you put the number from 7 to 12, even I don't know how to stimulate a woman. I think Dr. Manish, the representation has gone. We should uh, try and see if the word can be utilized rather than retrieval. Exactly. Retrieval, exactly. obviously, you'll have to do everything. If you leave something exactly. behind, that puts the donor more at risk of purchase. I think this is where we um, need to wait for the rules to come in and hope that there is more clarification and clarity on this. In fact, this was the time when in ICMR, I was very much part of the making of these kind of uh, rules in ICMR. When then at the time when Dr. P. C. Anand Kumar was there and then Dr. Bhargava was there and Anand Kumar was of the opinion that the aim in which he was actually making these uh, guidelines was to see that the woman was not harmed. You see, nature had decided that she gets one or two eggs and therefore you know, to pump more uh, gonadotrophins into her to see that she gets more eggs so if there is some kind of a limitation, but where that seven crept in, I don't know. That crept in, you know, at some point of time, it just landed up there when it went out of hand. So the idea was to be reasonable and to say that to make it minimal. Yes. But so, the no, number no, seven no. came in. So but that was no, the no. government's uh, idea was only to see that the woman uh, is not sort of... Uh, been down to produce more and more eggs as a result of which her uh, you know, body is harmed by putting too many, like almost 30, 35 to 60 eggs. And that was the reason why there was a limitation. So if the rules and regulations allow for a minimum stimulation, that would be better for the donor. That was the only idea that the government decided. So I think the uh, crux is minimal and safe stimulation. That is all. The That's number so when you look at 7, 12 or 15, no. from a medical perspective, it is always going to become a challenge. Absolutely. So number is going to be a challenge. Can I, can I yeah, just add? Very shortly, please. Brief. Very, very shortly. I think this is a classic example of victory of narrative over scientific fact. The fact is that the narrative which has been driven by activists, media, and even some well-meaning scientists has won over the scientific fact that nowadays what is important is not minimal stimulation, but safe stimulation. Absolutely. There is a big difference between the two. The fact is that with an antagonist protocol and agonist trigger, stimulation for donors has become remarkably safe. This might have been valid in the agonist era, but is certainly not valid in the antagonist era. So then I come to this clause section 29, which mentions that the sale, transfer, and even use of gametes is prohibited. I think, by Manish Bhai, I think uh, Dr. Madan Gopal wanted to say something. Yes, please. Sorry. Sorry, Dr. Madan Gopal. Uh, Manish Bhai, uh, just, uh, just a few, one addition, because uh, uh, this bill was introduced during the last session of the previous uh, parliament. Yes. And it was referred to the parliament standing committee. As I was going into the literature and the other details, it was the Parliamentary Standing Committee, they have invited uh, the experts and other person and thought of deliberation. Each and every line was uh, debated, deliberated, ICMR has given their responses. The one summer organization was also there, I could see notes from there. There were other organizations also which have given these notes. This is a very pertinent point that it has to be safe stimulation. Now, the uh, possibility which is coming, the, when the rules are being formed, we should be, whatever analysis and other things which we are doing with this uh, act, we want that uh, at least how we can get the things included in the rules. That's the challenge. 
and we should not be losing this opportunity once the rules are uh, once the rules come up for public uh, comments then we should be taking this opportunity and try to influence as far as possible because if you lose this opportunity then we have to live with the act and rules so then we come to this section which covers about sale and everything what we think purview of this or dr madan gopal again i think this on the one side prohibits the sale and then the issue of egg donation comes in so i am not understood does this mean that this has to be altruistic is it commercial is it anonymous and then then how will an art bank survive how will it make its money here okay manish bhai personally uh, this is very poorly drafted this component is poorly drafted that is prohibition on the sale transfer or use of gametes and abuse is poorly worded and will confuse foreign as well as domestic patients it is going to confuse we are having an options of influencing uh, this aspect during when the rules are formed apart so, from that this is likely to be the Yes, I think Dr. Shithij and Amit, if you could also give in a short comment on this, because this is something again very contradictory in the bill. So Shithij first, and then Amit. No, no, it is, it is, uh, it is extremely contradictory, Manish, and this is not the first time that the act has contradicted. But be as it may, uh, another thing that I would like to mention here, since Dr. Madan Gopal uh, mentioned about the rules, now I'm not very sure how the rules will override the provisions of the act itself. okay so whether the rule whether uh, see even if you see section 42 which jd pointed out in the beginning it doesn't really it 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 lays down a lot of mechanisms you know like consent forms you know dispute redressal mechanism and all those things but uh, ultimately rules are subservient to the act and you know and even if the national surrogacy board is set up they still have to take the government permission and notify those uh, changes so that is also there in the miscellaneous section of the act basically so i think so we are hoping i don't want to sound pessimistic i'm really hopeful that the representations that will go once the rules are in the public domain are considered or positively but i think so we are hoping too much from the rules manish to be very honest with you uh, let me be little frank here you know i have seen the consumer movement very closely i practice in this medical legal field for 21 years now even consumer rules came out after 2 years okay we don't know why it took so long i hope that the health ministry is faster than the consumer affairs ministry but uh, giving them the benefit of doubt uh, whatever is mentioned in the section 42 except for that last clause which gives okay. which which gives them little gives them little open endedness everything else is given in the section as to what rules you can make and i don't see any uh, way that a rules can override the provisions of the law which would mean that the government will have to move in an amendment bill which i see uh, it's not so easy to come given the circumstances that we are living in you know because parliament rarely functions because of various political reasons and uh, it's it let us not move to that area yeah. what is what do you like to comment and then i will come back to you dr madan gopal dr yeah. shithu how do you see this i think i think the surrogacy bill specifically says no commercial surrogacy and only altruistic is to be allowed there is no such statement when i read the oocyte donation or the gamete donation yes. so it's just that the you know the the section that you pointed in the last slide is confusing everyone the sale transfer of zygotes and gametes yes. so i think i, I agree with dr madan gopal that this has been loosely drafted yes. and i think it should get clarified with time because there's nothing no mention of banning any commercial oocyte or sperm donation but if you go again back to the jpc report one of the lines mentioned that is the entire purpose of the art act is altruism so again again we we sincerely hope that the rules give clarity on this yes because i mean a lot of lot of contradictory statements in there yes uh, manish bhai uh, we have to only wait for the rules because amendment the act is now just uh, they have enacted the act Rules yeah. are being framed. Unless some experience happens, it won't. Uh, the ministry won't take it further for the, the new amendment. So then, we, then there is one other. I just like sorry, but I just like to point out a small thing that uh, I think Amit, you and me and uh, Nandita, Rishma and Sarita had gone and we had actually made a presentation on this to the Standing Committee on Public Health in the Parliament. Yes. and a lot of what i'm saying now was presented to them at that time and i think has been minuted in the report so let's yes. hope the rules take cognizance of that hope so so i think then we come to one other area that is the role of pre implantation genetic testing 
a procedure which is used apart from known hereditary and genetic disorders also for women with advanced maternal age who have higher number of abnormal embryos so on the one side this act reduces their chances of a pregnancy through egg donation on the other side it will possibly we don't know so again come I in mean, this is a big challenge for this elderly women no on the one side Absolutely. this is this is really 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 sad really i mean i'm quite surprised that you know they've actually been silent on the fact that for you know senior women that the, the act does not talk about women of you know elderly age they only talked about pre existing heritable or genetic diseases only so where does these women say, women of you know uh, uh, you know advanced age or repeated ivf phases that's unless it comes into the rules i think we are doomed because that is a very large component of our pgs program so if we are going to sort of rule that out then the entire program because how many of the people are really going to have single gene disorders that's going to be a really a minuscule so until we really get into this this part of the program is really going to suffer a huge setback is what i would feel what i am hearing is that the fear is that ivf will be determination is going to but then if you go by that argument amniocentesis chorionic sampling non invasive prenatal testing these are all techniques which are regulated so all you need is regulation you need to ban this not thing. ban it and that is something which we need to look at so perhaps the rules should come in and uh, should allow for all the other things to be included in the regulations for the yeah. that would be if you just sorry uh, just to point out if you see section 253 it says that the national board can give clarifications on uh, testing yeah, and everything so there is a hope that tomorrow national yes, board so can uh, issue a guideline on that testing part so one other very unique feature of this act is that penalties are of uh, penalties are different <laughs> for the first and the second offense this is Uh, I mean, you are the lawyer, but do we have any other act where the first offence and second offence carry the different penalties? Why? What is this? And this also comes. Uh, I mean, let us say I. I mean, a lot of companies are there now. Group companies, chain. There is one CEO and ten companies. Two companies, two clinics commit an offence. First offence for each clinic, but the second offence for the company. I. I hope the rules give some clarity on this. <laughs> no, uh, Manish. Uh, again, uh, see, I tell you this. This this is germinating out of the PCP and DP and the uh, you know and the act that uh, you guys are governed right now. There is an immense uh, mistrust uh, in the mind of the government about how ART is being used, or you know, if you are talk about surrogacy, there is a misplaced fear in the mind of ministers, you know, uh, uh, in the government circles that you know women are getting exploited by uh, by patients and doctors. So this penalty. section is uh, is definitely harsh and uh, you know first offense second offense this is uh, this is something which is uh, you know originating out of sheer hate of someone in the ministry against your entire industry i guess you know so it's not seen regularly in other legislations but i think so you know on a lighter note i'm sure you guys have done something to uh, to, <laughs> to to face this kind of uh, you know backlash from the government and all the representations that we had made jaiti if i may take you back to that we had spoken very clearly about uh, you know making the offense this entire thing uh, as you know as much as uh, neutral as possible because these are uh, quite draconian provisions and uh, uh, you know if you ask me uh, this is going to definitely create a lot of fear in the minds of the practitioners i think this is yeah i think shitej i was but before that just a comment that i think this is possibly you are right that if the industry had followed self regulation possibly <laughs> we might not have reached this state possibly talk about i'm, I'm yes. sorry i i don't need to step in here i don't think we should be blaming ourselves the fact of the matter is that whatever the case may be whether we followed or not followed self regulation such draconian provision yes. yes. in the in the isolation of yes. our parliamentary democracy are absolutely incorrect let's not self flagellate why should we say that if we would have done something this would not have happened that means we are apologizing i am a good idf practitioner i have not made any mistake why should i also suffer because of this 
you know, so I, I don't think we should get go down that route at all. And I think before I go to Chiti, I think the question is there are enough legislations to control medical legal negligence. Why should we be punished by something or over and above this? Uh, Chiti, please. I think, I think, sir, Section 26, if I remember correctly, and Mr. Amit can comment, of PCP and DT Act also deals with uh, the officers, the owners, the clinic managers. And if you, if you can prove as a company, Company that you've given the requisite awareness to your doctors, you've done the training, you've done regular audits, you've highlighted the gaps and readdressed the gaps with them in terms of training or what they should follow. Then the company or the officers are shielded to an extent that something has happened without their knowledge or beneath them, you know, in spite of all the care that they have taken, then they should not be held responsible. So that is a protection given to all the officers, managers of the company. And I, I believe it would be replicated here as well. That is basically, Shittaj, if, if you may allow me to call you that, uh, is basically for the government officers who are taking action in good faith. That provision is reflecting in this act also. But Manish, before... No, no, no. No, no, there's a different provision for government officers in good faith and there's a different for the company and the officers. So unless it is... Otherwise, I would have sleepless nights every every <laughs> night twice, I would be sleepless. <laughs> and if you see the miscellaneous section, uh, the provisions of this act are over and about the Clinical Establishment Act and PCP and PCP. Yeah. So which means that if tomorrow PCP, if Clinical Establishment Act gets enacted, uh, get implemented here in the state of Maharashtra or any other states where it is not there, then you are having another set of laws that you need to cover basically. Okay, so that's us running about time. So I'll end with the last question that the act also mentions as to. But it's just one point. Yes. Um, may I ask uh, Dr. Madan Gopal, uh, why are doctors being punished under the Consumer Forum, Medical Council of India, and now with the uh, the thing with this uh, ART Act as well? Why should they be killed twice? Uh, uh, Dr. Kamliji, one of the uh, answers which I've been given, we, we should focus on documenting things. Because so that, uh, and apart from that, whatever we are doing, we should not be thinking that I am doing it in a good faith. We should be documenting each and everything. If you look at the practices which are happening in the Western world, they document everything. Even the dictation which the doctor is given, that is uh, digitalized and that information is available. So unless and until that practice come, we have enacted a, a clinical establishment act which mandates uh, electronic health record. But there is the adoption. Adoption is only unit territories and smaller states. We have to see that place is almost a decade now. If electronic health records, the digital things are there, which can assist the what was the situation when the decision was taken. Apart from that, um, I need to put on that uh, our fraternity people also they instigate. The, uh, the patients itself too, with the flaws and other things, if something goes wrong. We have to see that how we make a full proof of that. Everybody wants to do an ethical practice, and they do an ethical practice, but in good faith, they sometimes forget to keep the records. The records are the savior for each and every practitioner. So that's why this, uh, this kind of things are happening. Otherwise, it will not happen if records are there. This brings to the last question that I have that this. Act also mentions as to who can take cognizance. It is either the national board or the state board or by an officer authorized by it. And I think people are under the impression that since the national board and the state boards are not yet formed, even if there is something which you do which is not under the act, who will take cognizance of this? So the question to this is that there was an uh, application against the Right to In Information Act to which the government has already mentioned that Mr. S. N. Jasra has been designated as the appellate authority. So does this mean that the mechanism to take cognizance is already there and this can apply to you even in this six month transition period? No, no, it's a, these are two different questions. One is seeking information on the Right to Act. Every institution is having a uh, no, 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 the question is what the government has replied is that... I mean, I'm just coming to that because it's not, they are not related uh, to each other. One is uh, RTI Act, where an uh, institution has to have a CPIO and uh, as an appellate authority. This, the second one is regarding that. If you look at the, the this ART Act, this, this is a supplement to the Surrogacy Act, which was enacted in 
April 2016. And the mechanism is accessed in the Surrogacy Act. And uh, they, they are referring the section. Currently, the currently, currently, we don't have a mechanism for the Surrogacy Act as well. I think both the acts have been passed in tandem. So today, there is no mechanism for either of the acts. Okay. That means still the time, uh, this ambiguity is resolved. So it's a very difficult question to answer that. Otherwise, uh, as per the act, the provisions are given. That's section 15 of the Surrogacy Act. Uh, uh, the state board and the, the national board would be constituted and they would be given some powers. Apart from that, they would be having an appropriate authority at the district level also. I mean, from a legal perspective, how do you read this? So if, if someone commits an offense under this act, one, if the clinic is not registered, can it be even, uh, I mean, prosecuted under this act? And secondly, if at all, who will prosecute you? See, uh, Manish, prosecution can happen as and when the authority is set up or the mechanism comes into place. So if you see from the date of, according to me, in my opinion, uh, you may take second opinion if you wish to, that from the day of the setting up or the day of the uh, notification of the act, till the setting up of the mechanism or the appropriate authority, whatever is being done can be taken into consideration by the appropriate authority subsequently when it is set up. And once the powers are given to various uh, departments or government agencies or a separate entity is created altogether on the lines of ICMR, basically. Okay. Whoever it is, whatever it is, from the 25th of Jan 2022, if there is any uh, information which is given to them of a, of, a, of a violation, then they can prosecute you even though it may be you know, maybe six months, seven months down the line, or it may be even later on, provided they have that kind of information and they can prosecute you before a judicial magistrate or a metropolitan magistrate, whatever the case may be. So. Uh, what I mean in short is from 25th of Jan, you must follow the law in the later and in the spirit. Once the rules come, there will be further clarity on that, like uh, Dr. Madan Gopal also mentioned. And uh, we'll have to wait and watch when the government will set up the authorities. But meanwhile, following the due process of law is absolutely essential, Manish. So I think we have absolutely run out of time. I would conclude by, first of all, thanking all my panelists amazing discussion and I hope it was informative to all our listeners. Two comments, two suggestions. Everyone who is in the field of ART should read the act so that at least they know what is mentioned in the act. And every time you read it, you will find something new. And second, whether we like it or not, unless the act is amended in the parliament, let us think about how do we follow the act. And we hope that the rules will give much more clarity. So thank you all everyone. And I would also like to thank ET Health World for giving me this opportunity to conduct this panel with such eminent panelists. Thank you very much. Thank you.